All right, I, I have uh, the pleasure of introducing Ronnie Harris from Woodenville Alliance Church, who is a, uh, an Oregon duck, which, as an Oregonian, makes me proud. So, because I wear Oregon stuff proudly. Um, so, I'm going to let Ronnie take it away. He'll be taking tweets and uh, emails today. So, this is a cell phone appropriate chapel. So if you want to tweet questions to Ronnie, we'll take those at the end like we normally do. And uh, I'll just let Ronnie introduce himself. So thanks for being here, brother. Thanks. And uh, take it away. How's everybody doing today? It is uh, good to be here. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I have tons of com in common with you guys. Uh, even though uh, I am an Oregon Duck. I know a lot of people don't like Oregon. Uh, I, I played football in the NFL for about seven years. I'll tell you a few stories from that. But I actually went to Valley Christian High School in San Jose, California. So my experience through high school is uh, very similar to Bellevue Christian. Uh, I would say size-wise of the school when I was there, very similar to what you guys are at. Uh, my school is now a big 4A school uh, in California. It's grown a lot since I left. But um, uh, I, I, I know exactly... Uh, what it's like to be in chapels week after week. I know what it's like to take Bible class. I know what it's to be at a Christian school. Um, and so just from that standpoint, uh, I, I understand where you guys are at. So a little bit about myself is uh, I played in the NFL for, for seven years. I played on three different teams. And uh, no, I wasn't a kicker. That's usually the first question I get is because I'm not the biggest guy in the world. In fact, uh, Mike looks more like a football player than I do. But um, I was a wide receiver and a punt returner. Uh, played special teams. Uh, I played for the New England Patriots, the Seattle Seahawks, and the Atlanta Falcons. And then I played in the Super Bowl 33 in uh, January of 99, which was kind of like the culmination of my experience. Um, because I had seven years in the league, I played with a lot of different guys. And I, I wanted to start uh, quickly um, today just to give you a little bit of picture. And kind of it goes along with uh, some of my uh, talk here of um, last week, there was a, a prominent NFL player that committed suicide, Junior Seau. He, um, he played 20 years in the league, which is insane. Um, but when I was a rookie in 1993 in New England, and then my whole Seattle career, he was in San Diego. I played against him uh, every year. And so uh, I think he's a year older than me. But um, I'm just going to, we, we have a short little clip just from ESPN, just kind of give you a, a, a brief picture. It's like a five minute clip. I'll probably only run it about three minutes and then uh, we'll cut it off. But just wanted to give you a glimpse of, uh, of Junior real quick. So go ahead and play that. Tragedy in San Diego as the Chargers prepare to remember the life of Junior Seau. Now, Junior Seau is one of eight members of the 1994 AFC champion Chargers to have prematurely passed away since then. A member of the 1994 team actually joins us on the phone right now, John Perella, defensive tackle and currently the head coach at Valley Christian High School in Dublin, California. John, I want to ask you, a lot of people have been shocked by this. A lot of surprise out there. There apparently was not a pattern of mental instability here. How surprised were you when you heard about Junior Seau's passing? Uh, you know, like, just crushed. I mean, you're talking about not only just a great, maybe one of the best all-time linebackers in the game, but probably one of the, one of the best all-time people off the field. I mean, I, myself and my family, we were just crushed. A man that we all loved. Uh, a lot of people talked about his uh, character off the field, but his commitment as a player on the field was truly remarkable. I read a stat the other day saying that he only missed nine games due to injury in his first 14 seasons as a pro. Talk to, about his, talk to us about his ability to tolerate that kind of pain. Yeah, Junior was an incredible player, as we all know, but you know, he played banged up a lot. You know, I can remember him playing in Seattle uh, years ago when he had a broken rib or it was, uh, and played the whole game in just dire pain. I and mean, he was truly the, you know, the prototype uh, linebacker. You know, his ex-wife and a former neighbor of his uh, told the press recently that he suffered multiple concussions, uh, hundreds, maybe even thousands of concussions uh, during his career as a professional football player. Do you think there was any impact there between that and then life after football? 
you know, I, I have no idea. I'm sure there's something to it, but I just hope that the experts will really take a look into it and, and do everything they can to protect, uh, you know, the professional players like Junior who have played such a long, long time that we can, uh, you know, we can make sure these kind of incidents don't happen again uh, to anyone. Is there anything that uh, certainly the members of the 1994 roster perhaps have been brought closer together by the, by the tragedies that have happened uh, since 1994? Are you guys checking in on each other more? I mean, what happens when you guys get these phone calls through the years that another teammate's passed away? Well, I think the biggest thing is you just, it's just a, it crushes you. These are guys that were, you know, they went in and put on the armor, um, played you know football for a long, long time, and when you walk away, it's time to you know, do something else special in your life. And and you know, it's just a crushing blow to see guys that, that paid such a tough penalty to, uh, to play the game, or you know, tragedies are happening uh, to them. Now you guys play uh, obviously sixteen games together. So uh, than whatever. So I wanted to see that list of eight names because basically from the 1994 AFC Championship team, they're talking about um, eight guys have died. Um, they, don't, uh, they don't list how all of them died, but half of them died due to suicide, depression, some type of uh, tragic uh, um, kind of self-inflicted situation. You know, right now they're doing concussion studies on guys in the NFL because they're, they're thinking that repeated cu concussions over time does something in the brain chem chemistry that predis predisposes uh, guys to maybe uh, depression, stuff like that. I actually think there's way more to the story. I think it's less scientific than that. I mean, that, that, might, that may be true. But uh, what they don't tell you and what our uh, NFL, NFL Players Association, they put out statistics, and the statistics are unreal. So two years, this is when I, when I was done playing uh, 12 years ago. Uh, two years after NFL guys are done playing, 75% of guys... 75% of guys are divorced, bankrupt, unemployed, or a combination of the three. Serious depression, serious, like, they just don't know what to do. Their lives are a mess. And so um, I just wanted to, to, to set the stage a little bit because Junior Seau made more money than most people in the world will make. Um, he had a, a, a fame lifestyle he had, he had basically everything. He went to the Pro Bowl 12 out of his 20 seasons. Uh, he was loved by everybody. Uh, and so a guy like that all of a sudden commits suicide. You got to think, what is going on? And the thing is, in life, the game changes, but your purpose doesn't, unless you don't have a purpose. I didn't know Junior personally. Like, he wasn't my friend. I didn't talk to him on the phone or anything like that. But my guess is, because I see a lot of guys like this in the NFL, their purpose is solely football. And so when football ends, especially if you have a pro career that lasts a few years, your identity becomes uh, your job. And certainly when your identity includes fame and money, um, it, it's just like this snowball effect that uh, guys get through playing football, they just don't know what to do. So um, it, it, this is not uncommon at all. I mean, the suicide is pretty extreme, but there's a lot of guys, uh, former NFL players, that go through serious depressions. So, um, so I'm just here today. I'm just like a regular guy. I was literally sitting in your seat uh, in 1984, 85, 86, 87 when I was in high school, listening to chapels, going to Bible study, playing a couple sports, had no clue anything was going to happen. Um, University of Washington actually recruited me first. Uh, they actually, and then they dogged me. So I think I maybe wear more Oregon stuff just because, uh, just, I don't know, it's kind of a dig back to University of Washington or something. But they actually had girls calling my house. It was very inappropriate. But um. They, uh, but I just want to tell you a, a few stories. You know, when I first got in the NFL, I was, uh, you know, I, as far as being a football player, I had a purpose. I was a, a, a punt returner and a wide receiver. And um, uh, my purpose was very clear. In fact, there, I was not drafted. 1993, I came out of Oregon. Um, Drew Bledsoe came out of Washington State. He was the number one pick that year. He was the, the quarterback that went to New England. And I was like low man on the totem pole. There's like 12 receivers trying to make the team, and I'm probably receiver number 11 or 12, but I also punt returned. Very first drill, all these guys, there's like 20 guys trying to punt return because everyone's just trying to make the team. And Bill Parcells was our coach. Uh, that name probably doesn't mean uh, anything except maybe some of the teachers or something, but he's like this old school, real hard-nosed football coach and stuff, but he stops the whole drill. And he's like, everybody look at Harris. All right. Ronnie, show us how it's done. Of like how to technically catch a punt correctly. 
So, I mean, talk about pressure. I'm a free agent. I'm a rookie. I'm low man on the pole. And yet they're like, okay, Ronnie's going to show all these guys. And again, I didn't look a whole lot different than I look now. I'm not a big guy. Um, I'm not a black guy. I mean, just, you know, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. And, and I say that because I, ha I, I spent a decade in, in locker room settings and my best friends were African-American and stuff. So when I say stuff, um, it's because I'm, I have very close friends and stuff and, and I can say it. Some things you can't say, I've tried to say it and I realize you can't say it, but I won't go there today. Um, but anyway, so, uh, so I was a punt returner, but when, it, it, when you make a team in the NFL, you can't just punt return. So the very first game, um, I actually... Uh, made the practice squad first, which means all you do is practice, and then you can get activated. I get activated 10 games into my rookie season. On a Friday after practice, Bill uh, Parcells came to me, and he's like, hey, Harris, you know your plays? And I was like, yes. He goes, you better, because you're playing Sunday. And this is Friday, and we're going to play Pittsburgh Steelers at Pittsburgh on December 5th. Uh, so I'm literally shaking on the inside, uh, because I'd been kicking it every weekend. I, I wasn't playing. So I go in, and... Uh, the very first play of my very first NFL game, they put me on kickoff coverage right next to the kicker. I've never covered a kick in my life. I've never tackled anybody like Jake Vandenbreek's size, but that's the type of guy that I gotta, I gotta tackle, or uh, Mr. Olson's size. So if you know anything about football, which if you don't, it's okay. Um, if, if you're right next to the kicker, you're the wedge buster. So do I look like a wedge buster, even if you don't know what that means? No, I'm not a wedge buster. But so there's like four guys, again, guys bigger than Jake, that, um, that are like basically arm in arm, that are all running together, and their job is to literally mow down anybody that's coming after him. And so um, I'm in that position where I got to run down the middle. So my very first game of my, uh, of my, of my NFL career uh, the game changed. My purpose was the same. I'm a football player. I need to, I need to play this game. But um, the game changed for me in the sense they're asking me to go tackle somebody um, bigger than me and all this kind of stuff. So I'm fast. I ran track in college. I'm really fast. Um, despite my whiteness, I'm fast. Um, again, I can say some of these things. Um, don't necessarily repeat them. But um, So anyway, my first kickoff, I'm running down and I'm like in front of everybody, like we got all my teammates, and I'm like running in front, and I'm like, this is sweet, you know, I'm like in front of everybody, it's my first NFL game. Now, normally you watch film before a game, and you know what's going to happen. So um, I didn't have that luxury because I got activated Friday uh, before a Sunday game, so I didn't watch any film. Normally, you actually know who's going to block you. Now, if they have a wedge, you know it's going to be a wedge. Sometimes they have crossing guys. So... Uh, this is an awesome experience. First play, first NFL game. I'm running as fast as I can. I'm ahead of everybody. I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, this is awesome. I'm in the NFL. I'm running. And then literally, I am flying horizontally through the air because some guy came along and just de me. You football players know what that is. And I'm literally flying through the air sideways. Um, I didn't get knocked out, but I literally had no idea where I was, hit the ground, no idea where the ball was, anything. And I was just like, man, I hope nobody saw that. So then I start jogging back to the sideline, and then all of a sudden, like, it's like this thing in my ear. It's like these four-letter words mixed with my coach's voice, just I'm getting yelled at. Harris, keep your head on a swivel. I mean, just yelling at me. So that's my first play. So um, the game changes, but your purpose doesn't. And so when I was in the NFL, um, crazy stuff happens. I mean, so I, I played in New England for a couple years. I come to Seattle. I play in Seattle. Uh, and... Uh, I got, I got cut after playing three years of special teams, like kickoff coverage, kickoff return, punt coverage, punt return. I'm catching touchdown passes in preseason games, doing good and all this stuff. Well, then we get a new special teams coach. Um, I'm not playing. Then all of a sudden, six games in the season, I get activated because I wasn't playing. And uh, we played against the Raiders on a Sunday night, ESPN on national TV. Um, we had five turnovers. I was the fifth one. I fumbled a punt. I caught a punt and they got tackled, fumbled. So I got cut the next day. And uh, I thought maybe my career was over. I'm done. I mean, I had played like five years at that point and I was like, man, this is it. I mean, the game just changed for me. Ten weeks later, I was literally playing in the Super Bowl for another team. I mean, just, I, I could never have predicted it. I, I could never have like imagined what that would have been like. 
um, getting cut, having a team saying, I want you. You're no good. You're, you're a detriment to our team. Have another team pick me up. And then to the point where I actually was playing in the Super Bowl, I caught two passes in the Super Bowl, almost had a touchdown. Uh, just amazing experience. So the game changes. But so I'm talking about football and talking about purposes like that. But my purpose in life, I, I, I like you, uh, I was at a Christian school, but everyone I know is different here. Some people, you guys are Christians, you come from a Christian family. Some people, not so much. Some people may know or may, or may not know about your true thoughts and beliefs about God and Jesus and stuff. I was a Christian. Uh, uh, I prayed with my mom when I was eight years old, went through Christian school and stuff. So my faith was always a part of my life. And so my NFL experience, I use that as a platform that God gave me to uh, share my faith. And I did it through testimonies. I did it through the way I lived. I, did, I mean, I was, I was all over the place. I mean, I lived the kind of pseudo-celebrity life for a while. I went uh, for New England. Your rookie year, you have to go um, make appearances, sign autographs and stuff. And it's just awesome, the experiences you have. I mean, I, I, I'm signing this autograph at this carnival. I mean, like, just like for two hours straight, there's like all these kids in line, and they want my autograph. I'm a rookie. They don't even know who I am, but they're just like, you're a, you're a New England Patriot. And uh, so this one girl, she's like 12 years old. She comes up, and I start to sign the thing. She goes, you play for the Patriots? And I was, yeah. I was like, yeah. She goes, you guys suck. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I just got here. We're going to be better next year. I mean, it was just like I got all kinds of things happen. But one of the things that I did with my platform that, that is still valid today, which I thought when I was done playing football, it would end, but it's kind of funny if I don't wear my NFC championship ring, which I wore today just so you know, I could show some people, if I don't wear my ring, people actually don't believe that I'm a football player. I mean, imagine that. So when I was uh, in my second career, I was in sales for a while, I was signing in uh, to, to an office, and you know, I had my ring on, and the, the receptionist's like, so what is that? And I'm like, she goes, is that like a high school ring? And I was like, no, I actually used to play football. She's like, like, for what? I was like, well, I played for the, uh, in the NFL. She's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> and I was like, no, really, I did. She goes, no, you didn't. And I'm like, no, seriously, I did. She, she's like, did you get that on eBay? <laughs> and I was like, that would be really sad if I like, paid for a ring on eBay and uh, I actually uh, said that it was mine and it wasn't really mine. So I had to go down to my car and get a football card because I had football cards and I, I, I brought it to prove that I, was a, that I used to play football. So I've had kind of funny experiences. But that card... Actually, it was a custom card that I put my testimony on the back. And, uh, and so, like, literally, I've done everything from, you know, when I had a whole bunch of them, I'm kind of running out. I'm pretty much out. I need to reorder if I want to keep doing this. But I would come to something like this, and I'd bring, like, 200 cards and just give them to everybody. Um, and, and, but then I'd drive through, like, uh, you know, a fast food restaurant, and as I get my thing, I'd, I'd give a card out. So, so I was trying to use what God gave me and I say God gave me the platform of, of, of NFL because I didn't really have any right to be there, I didn't feel. Um, except that, you know, I, he gave me some talents, abilities, and I worked hard and all that kind of stuff. But, but really, I mean, I, it, it, in the huddle for the Seahawks, the guy next to me, his nickname was House because he was big as a house. He was 300, 6'7", 330 pounds. And I stood right next to him in the huddle. So it was just kind of common. I was like, hey, Howard, how you doing? And uh, so that, that was kind of my existence. So... Rewind back to college. Uh, I went to University of Oregon. I, I went on a football scholarship. Um, my role, my, my purpose back then as a football player was I was a receiver punt returner. So I was a receiver first. I never punt returned at Oregon. I was always the backup re returner. So it wasn't until my senior year I get into uh, the very first game. There was a junior, a guy younger than me, that was uh, the starting punt returner. So for all intents and purposes, I was never going to punt return in Oregon. But you know what? My role, I was just given a role and, uh, to be a backup, and I, just, I caught punts before every single game. First play, first game, senior year, he gets tackled, blows out his knee. I get my name called. The game changed for me, but my purpose didn't as a football player to do what I was called to do. Um, you're going you're to catch this theme as I keep going, uh, and, and I'll, start, I'll make it more overt as I go, but... Your game of life will change, but your purpose doesn't in Jesus. And that, that's the key. I'm talking about purpose in Jesus doesn't change. So it doesn't matter if good things are happening in life, bad things are happening in life, things you expect happen in life, or things that you don't expect. Because the older you get, all these 
old people that are teaching like me, um, they will attest when you go through life, things will happen unexpectedly. Football is a good example because it's kind of dramatic and all this kind of stuff. But, um, you know, when I was, uh, when I was in uh, college, I actually, one of the things, I actually helped lead my wife to the Lord. Um, again, like I was, I was a football player and I was just uh, a division one athlete and everything. But when I started dating my wife, she did not have a relationship with Christ. Um, I took her to a Billy Graham crusade and all of a sudden, like at the end of the, um, the, the talk, she's like cruising down and for the altar call. And I was like, oh my gosh. But it was because I was very intentional about who I was. The interesting thing is I was not nearly as confident in my spiritual walk as, as I am now. Um, I wasn't nearly as like confident about either scripture or just who I was as a person, but, but I knew that God loved me and I knew I had a relationship with Jesus. And it, it, so you don't have to be a theologian. It's whatever platform God puts in front of you, you can use it. I even used it with my then girlfriend who became my wife. We've been married 20 years. We have two daughters, uh, 17 and 14. So um, whatever you use, whatever God puts in front of you, whether it's jobs, experiences, people, you can use for the glory of God. So the game will change for you, but your purpose doesn't in Jesus. So like I said, in high school, uh, I went to Valley Christian High School. I'm kind of like working from NFL and college, now back to high school. Uh, I went to Valley Christian, again, just like you. I had no clue that um, I had a chance to play the, uh, in, the, in college and football until, until it started happening. Um, and again, I went to school with guys that uh, a few years later, um, they were in the closet and then they came out of the closet. They were, they were, they were gay. No one, no one knew it when we, they were at the school. There's probably someone here like that. Um, I, went to, I went to school with people who, um, again, weren't Christians. Um, they had horrible experiences. Um, there, there is probably a couple of people that are not having a great experience. Um, I went to school with um, people, uh, one of my friends that I knew since second grade, really wealthy family. Um, he had some of the craziest, craziest parties. It wasn't the public school kids, it was him. So again, I, I actually know the profile of, of everybody. And there's a lot of you um, that, like me, I mean, I had a fantastic experience. I'm still, I'm closer to my high school friends uh, to this day than any other um, a phase of my life. So more than college, more than pro, more than any other job. Um, I can call up any one of my uh, core group of guys from, uh, from my high school and we can literally talk about real stuff because we had, we had a spiritual bond together that, that, that lasted through all that. So I, again, I know what it's like even though I've had um, these experiences post high school. So once I was done playing football, I was 30 years old. I was like, what am I going to do with my life? Um, I got into... Um, selling pharmaceutical drugs. Um, I usually, for shock effects, say I was selling drugs, which I was selling drugs, but they're good for you drugs. So like um, cholesterol medication, um, allergy medication. Um, and I have to admit, I did sell Viagra. It's like uh, awkward, I know, uh, but I did. I sold it. It's one of the most well-known brands in the world. Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Viagra. Literally, you can go anywhere <laughs> And people know about that stuff. So, um, so the funny thing is, I sold, and they're all, I, at one point, I sold four billion dollar drugs. Each one of them earned a billion dollars a year. Viagra, Lipitor, Zyrtec, Zithromax, Zithromax for antibiotics. I sold those. And, uh, but you know, it's kind of funny. So I, I get into this career, all my other, my early life, high school, college, even pros, there was a certain amount of structure around me, right? So um, I was kind of like, it was such a cool opportunity to get a football scholarship. It's like, well, yeah, I'm going to go to a school that offers me a football scholarship because I had a couple schools offer me. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go to Oregon. And then uh, uh, I had a chance to go in the NFL. I actually interviewed for Macy's to work in uh, their executive management program after college. And I said, well, I think I'm going to go with the NFL. And so I had this like cool opportunities that I went with. Well, all of a sudden I'm in pharmaceuticals. I'm like 33 years old. I'm like, is this what I'm supposed to do with my life? So the, the game had changed. I made a decision to get a job um, that was a good job by all means. But I'm like, you know what? Is this, is this, like, is this following like, the desires of my heart? Or better said, is this following what I feel like God has for me? So I started a couple of scary things. I had a journal. I'm like, God, what do you want me to do in my life? I don't know if this is it. 
See, I sold drugs that actually made people's life better and last longer. Uh, the, the cholesterol medication made that last longer. Okay. Um, so, so but, but I was like, is it, is it worth it? I got to put my head on the, on the bed at night and, and put my head on the pillow and say, okay, so I sell a product that makes people's lives last longer, um, but what if they don't know Christ? That was literally, that was important to me. And so ultimately, I started saying, God, what do you want me to do? And that eventually led to me um, quitting my job of a very good paying job um, to go into what started as youth ministry. And, and again, I'm at Woodenville Alliance Church, and uh, um, I get to preach now a lot and stuff. And so, um, so I, I, I really, I, I, I tried to align my role and my purpose because I felt like, okay, I'm now at a point in my life where I'm going to make a decision where I'm going to align my role and my purpose. Now, you can have all kinds of roles and serve the same purpose, meaning you can be a Christian and you can have about any job that's out there. That's, and, and that's awesome. And you can actually use whatever platform God gives you, whatever job, whatever circumstance you're in, you can use. It's your choice. For me, I, I, I felt God kind of leading me this direction. And so ultimately, like, what is the purpose? And this last couple minutes, and then uh, I'm going to allow questions. If you guys have been tweeting uh, questions, um, I'll answer anything. I'm very open book. Um, but, but the final just little thing I want to leave you with, and this is, uh, this is the part where I'm actually a, a youth pastor and associate pastor, and I preach a little bit, so this is, I just can't help but do this a little bit. So our w- w- purpose is very clear in the Bible, but it's, it's, so, it's so awesome. I'll just super quick, Genesis 39, story of Joseph. You guys have heard it probably. You, maybe you've read it. Maybe you've studied it. The cool thing is I just want to focus on this word bless and uh, Austin and Lucas, you guys, you guys heard this the other day because I heard this and it just was awesome. So we, we, we talk about this word bless. You guys, maybe it's a Christian word. It's get used a lot and stuff. But Joseph, after he got sold into slavery, it said that the Lord was with him. Now in the United States, blessing is associated with money. Junior Seo is a good example. By all means, he was, he should, if that's your definition, he was blessed about more than anybody in the world. I don't know, it's, it's usually published how much NFL players make, so I could probably look it up and find out how much Junior made in his career. It's probably, you know, $100 million, literally. And these days, that, that's actually, you know, there's a lot of baseball players and basketball players that make more than that. But um, he made so much money. That is not blessing. That is not blessing. In, uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 39, it just says the, um, the Lord was with Joseph and he had success where he was. So the first thing, we are blessed if we have God's presence. If you have a relationship with God, you are blessed. Doesn't matter if you have a lot of money, no money. Doesn't matter if you got sold into slavery, if you got kicked out of school, if you have to move to another state, bad things will happen in your life. Not a determination of blessing or not. It's a... Uh, whether God's with you. Secondly, is Joseph, without getting into the whole story, um, he was under the palace guard Potiphar, and basically he did so good that Potiphar was blessed. So we are blessed. We're called to be a blessing. So as a believer in Christ, you're called to be a blessing to other people. And so because Joseph was blessed, Potiphar was blessed. So you can be a blessing to non-Christian people. It's an amazing thing. Third thing and final thing is, if you read along that story, what happened? Sexual temptation. Potiphar's wife wanted to sleep with Joseph. He resisted. He fleed. Is that right? Fleed? He flew? Fled. See, I knew it didn't sound right. So, uh, so the thing is, in order to remain blessable, you have to take care of possible sin in your life. For him, it was sexual temptation. Uh, for us, uh, it's sexual temptation, but it's any temptation. If we don't attend to sin in our life, we, remove, we can remove blessing by not being blessable. So uh, we're all Christ ambassadors. The game will change for you. The cool thing is in this room, uh, there is amazing potential and talent, not only for worldly success, but for kingdom success that's my prayer for you guys for kingdom success. And uh, 
We got a few more minutes, so I'll just go ahead and say, what do you got? You got any tweets? I do. I do. And a hot mic. Uh, is there one thing that you wish you did that you didn't do when you still played in the NFL? I guess it's regrets of... Uh, so, yeah. Uh, that's, a good, that's a good point. So, in the NFL, you have these off-seasons, which... On one hand, you can do anything you want in the off seasons, but really pretty much as soon as March hits, you got to be working out. You're in an off season program. You have to work out January and February if you don't make the playoffs. And so really you, it's a pretty structured year round schedule, but you have the luxury of like, you have more time. You go work out for a few hours in the morning. You have, you have the rest of the day, right? So right now I'm working on a master's of theology, uh, maybe a master's of divinity if, uh, if I can keep going to school for a long time. Um, I wish that I would have, uh, uh, God would have like um, pinned me down, so to speak, earlier so that I would have had this vision because I'm like trying to catch up and go to school and I love to learn and stuff. So I would have spent my off seasons a little bit differently. I would have got a degree actually in the off season. There's a lot of NFL players that get law degrees, all kinds of stuff in the off season. I didn't do that. I'm going to school now. It's not that big of a deal because it's God ordained right now anyway, so. Have you ever gotten into a fight with a reporter? <laughs> and I would expand that to say just how did you, how did you learn to handle media, yeah. both scrutiny and uh, attention? Yeah. You know? So uh, media. So Bill Parcells, that first coach I told you about, again, he's like a hard-nosed coach. He's been around forever. He's seen it all. So he educated us very well on the media. He would always talk about how um, they're not your friend, he, uh, to, to not trust him, all this kind of stuff. And if there's like a podunk, I was in Boston. So if there's a podunk paper, like Pawnee, Pennsylvania, um, you know, reporter, and he's asking you a question, he's like, that, qu that answer will get printed in the Boston Globe. And so he had a great distrust for uh, media. One of the best things I had, um, I lost, it was old VHS tape, I lost it. But it was like 10 questions not to ask Bill Parcells because he would literally just bite the heads off of reporters. It was awesome. And so uh, but, uh, the way I viewed uh, sign autographs, the public, which included the media, is that was a part of my job. Again, I looked at being in the NFL as a privilege and not a right. And so I approached it where I was like always like, uh, I like talking to him and stuff. Um, I learned how to give like, you know, non-controversial answers that wouldn't be held against me later on, stuff like that. So they, they kind of teach you that don't sell out your teammates, don't sell out your coaches, stuff like that. So they definitely coached us on that. But I, I viewed them like they're people trying to do a job, and I, I like talking to them. So. How did you learn to be a man in a very hyper-masculine mm. culture? And I don't say hyper-masculine positively. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's particularly in the idea of... Uh, this is, this is about me, uh, I'm important because of all these things. And, and uh, let's be straight, I mean, a lot of, a lot of men mm -hmm. don't, yeah. don't treat women well, they don't treat each other yeah. well. How did you, when did you first start to see that and how did you, how'd you deal with that? Um, so 100% honest answer is that without Jesus in my life, I would have been a highly different person um, I already had tendencies to have certain character traits. And so without Jesus in my heart at your age, um, the NFL would have probably been a little bit more of a disaster for me. So uh, if you think about how Christ led, he was a servant leader. He, 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 he came with humility to serve. And so I, 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 that's part of my character because of Jesus, not because of me perfecting it. It's because of Jesus. So when I was in the NFL, it's this hyper... Uh, um, masculine, testosterone, everything is a competition. You're always trying to beat the next guy. I mean, I would just try to channel those things appropriately on the field and, uh, and just, um, again, I was like an anomaly. I wasn't, I, I drove my 89 Nissan pickup truck the first six years on the NFL and that actually, you know, that was literally one of my ways of being like, okay, um, I don't have to drive a convertible Mercedes uh, like the guy next to me. A, because I, didn't make, I, I made a tenth of what he made, but then B, because I was like, you know what? Um, he's doing it for the flash and the show. Ironically, that guy, um, I ran into him a few years later. Uh, actually, I read about him in the paper. He was one of the deadbeat dads of Washington State because he wasn't paying child support. Um, and so this guy that was living large back then, new convertible Mercedes every uh, training camp, um, 
wasn't ta- he, didn't, he never took care of his family. And that's, that, that's the sad thing about the NFL there are, and pro sports in general. There's a lot of people, a lot of guys that their character is flawed and it comes out in their behavior, which would be like, you know, knocking up a bunch of women all over the place, having kids all over the place. Uh, two track questions. Uh, what was your 40 yard dash time? Uh, four, three, one. Mine as like well. This. Okay. Um, <laughs> and your uh, 40, 40 yard, 40 foot, same thing. Uh, and what was your 100 meter time? Um, 10.39 was my best. So I was a fast white guy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't as much. So um, did you go to the Olympics for track? Uh, no, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's a great question. So um, my, my highest... I was on the four by one team at Oregon that um, our four by one record had not been broke for 30 years. I was on the team that broke it and we held the record for about 13 years. Um, I took fifth in the Pac-10 in the 400 meters. The guy that took first place won the Olympics that year in Barcelona in 1992. Uh, Quincy Watts was his name. So I ran next to guys. I had a good view of his behind, uh, but that's about it. Yeah. (laughs) That's going to end up in the Boston Globe. What, <laughs> go back, when you talked about, you know, my, my faith, if it had to have been for Jesus, you know, I would have been like a lot of those other guys. Can you think of examples or walk us through, like, what was that actually like? Because one of the things I know teenagers struggle with is the idea of, okay, kind of here's, here's faith, he, here's life, you know, does God like really talk to me? Does he, like, like what, what do I do with that? How did your relationship with Christ really shape the decisions you made either mm. to do something to stay away from something yeah uh, like uh, taking you in the way back machine but how yeah. did you so what you guys are learning uh literally in chapels and bible bible classes and stuff those are seeds that were planted for me too that shaped my worldview your worldview determines everything about you and how you make decisions in the future so my worldview was based in jesus from the time just like you guys in high school So when I got to the NFL and I had a teammate that he was married and he had kids just like me, and yet as soon as we landed in Buffalo for a a game against the Bills, he would go to a strip club. And he's like, oh, you know what, me and my wife, we're we're, we're cool with it. Um, she's, She's cool with it. Now, his wife looked for, like, stripper. I mean, because she was, I felt she was competing with probably what, he was looking at elsewhere. And so to him, it, like his worldview had a totally different foundation than the foundation that I had, which was in Jesus, which started uh, when I prayed with my mom and uh, I, I started being discipled. And part of my discipleship was literally chapels at high school, Bible class, which turned into uh, in college, an athletes in action uh, guy, which is a division of Campus Crusade, met with me weekly. Just to, just to be my friend in Christ, but just to you know, kind of ask me how life was going, share some stuff. I'd go to Bible studies and stuff. So it, it's like this deliberate march over time to be intentional to what God planted in my heart when I was young. Uh, final thought here. What, what advice would you give to particularly the seniors who are going off to college next year? And, yeah. and one of the things um, that college kids, particularly, they, they tend to think more highly of themselves yeah. than, than they ought to. Um, and then it, it's, it's no different than, um, you know, any, any other time you, you kind of move up, you feel like you're at the next level. Mm-hmm. Um, and you and I were joking around a little earlier, you and I are old enough uh, that we realize, you know, kind of how dumb we really are. And by the grace of God, <laughs> you know, here we are. Uh, what advice would you give kids who are either uh, in the limelight due to whatever whatever uh, gifts they have, kids are about ready to move on, just in terms of, of being rooted in Christ, being humble, um, and being uh, used yeah. by him. Because, you know, college is a great thing. It's a platform. Yeah. Um, but it's not an end in and of itself. So uh, my experience is that um, two things will happen. You will get opposition to your faith. You will get peer pressure. I mean, you guys already experience it at a certain level uh, now, but you will get opposition to your faith, but you will think that people don't respect you for taking a stand, and that's how it may, it may appear at first, but my experience, that one guy that I was talking about going to the strip club, um, he was really good friends with another Christian guy on the team, and then I was friends with him too, and he respected our stand. Now, he gave us a hard time, 
made fun of us, but respected. And so um, who knows what fruit that'll produce in his life over the long haul, but you will get opposition to your faith, but taking a stand is the right thing to do, even if you can't see a, a benefit right there. But the benefit is that they actually will respect you. The more compromise they see in your life, the less they respect you because you're saying one thing, doing another. That's hard. You got, I mean, that's stuff we got to, you got to make choices every day of your life from here on out that, that'll affect that. But my, my experience taking a stand, even if I endured a little bit of ridicule at some point, um, I've had people come back around and when uh, bad stuff happens in their life, who do they go to? They go to the guys on the team that they see have the most solid foundation would happen to be people with Christ in their life. And so that, that's been my experience. So, yeah. Hey, let's pray for you and then Thanks. we'll uh, go hang. Father, thank you for uh, having Ronnie come here today. Thank you for the work that you have done in his life that you are doing. Thank you for the, the wisdom that he shared with us here. We lift up his um, his work at Woodenville Alliance and, and wherever you would have him uh, go, not only as a, as a pastor, but as a, a husband, as a father, and and a disciple of you, Lord. Um, we thank you for um, how much you love us, Lord, and I just pray that you would use us uh, to do your work and uh, that we would be your, your vehicles for that. In your name, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, brother. Yeah, thanks. All right. Thanks.